Welcome to our podcast series and in this podcast we're going to be focusing on system technologies. This will involve a discussion about questions related to hardware and software in computing. These topics are from question 2 of the 2004 Information Technology or IT November exam and there are three ways I suggest that you can engage with the content from this podcast. Option number one is if you want to test your knowledge, then first download the questions covered in the video. There is a link to a PDF in the video description below. Then I would attempt the questions in that document and then come back and listen to the discussed answers and then compare them with your answers. Another way to engage in the content is to use option two. If you want to use the podcast to learn new information, then listen to the discussion first, then download the questions from the document that we mentioned earlier, and then test yourself to see how much you remember from the discussion. And then our third option is to simply enjoy the discussion by listening to it and learning more about systems technologies. And now let's hear what our podcasts have to say on systems technologies. Imagine, just for a second, a huge live event, you know, like a marathon, miles long, thousands of runners, maybe millions watching worldwide. Now think about all the tech behind the scenes just to get that broadcast out smoothly. The timing, the cameras, commentary, all that data flowing in real time. It's, uh, it's pretty complex, right? So today we're doing a deep dive into the computer tech that makes events like that possible. And really the stuff that runs our whole digital world. We're trying to understand the basic building blocks that make it all, well, work. And our sources for this, it's actually pretty cool, some questions and answers from an IT systems technology paper. It gives us a really direct way into these core computer ideas. Our mission then is to break down these, you know, sometimes complex hardware and software concepts, make them easy to digest for you, especially if you're, say, a grade 12 student getting into computers or really just anyone curious about the tech you use every day. We want you to get properly well informed. Mm. Okay, let's, uh, let's unpack this. We've got some specific questions here about how computers function, and they're actually a perfect way to get at the foundations of computing. Yeah, what's really interesting is how these questions, which might seem a bit academic, connect directly to real challenges. Like making sure that marathon broadcast doesn't glitch, we'll connect those dots for you, help you see the practical side of each concept, you know, from inside the chip right out to the global network. All right, let's start with something everyone hates slow computers. At a live event, even a tiny delay, that's a broadcaster's nightmare. And this brings us straight to computer performance, starting with memory. We always hear, get more RAM if your computer's slow, but what does RAM, primary memory, actually do, especially when speed is critical? Right, so RAM, random access memory, it's basically temporary storage for data, the CPU, the processors actively using right now. Think of it like the CPU's uh, short-term scratch pad. Yeah. Super fast. It's vital because it gives instant access to the data the CPU needs now. If there isn't enough RAM, the CPU just sits there waiting. And that's what causes those slowdowns you mentioned. Okay. So like a workbench, the CPU is doing its work and everything it needs is right there on the bench ready to grab. But then there's this other thing called cache memory. People say it's even faster. How does that fit in if RAM's already supposed to be fast? Good question. Cache memory is a tiny amount of extremely high-speed memory. Often it's built right onto the CPU ship itself, or it's very, very close its job, to score the data and instructions that are used most frequently or were just used. The real magic of cache is that it's like an ultra-fast buffer between the super-fast CPU and the slightly slower RAM. It basically stops the RAM, which is slower than the CPU, from becoming a bottleneck. It makes sure the CPU gets the absolute most critical data, like, instantly. Ah, okay. So going back to your workbench analogy, cache is like having the exact screwdriver you use constantly sitting right next to your hand on the bench. Instead of having to reach over to the main toolbox, the RAM, every single time, it just optimizes for those really common quick tasks. Keeps the CPU busy. That makes perfect sense. Optimizing for the repetitive stuff. Is there, like, a point where just adding more cache doesn't help much? Or is bigger always better? Yeah, that's a really good point. It's a trade-off. Uh, more cash generally helps, yes, but you hit diminishing returns. At some point, making the cash bigger gets really expensive and complex, <laughs> and the speed boost you get just isn't worth it. Engineers are always trying to find that perfect balance for different kinds of chips. Right. Okay, now let's flip to something that can actually hurt performance. Virtual memory. Sounds useful. Like extra memory, right? But the technicians warned it could slow things down. Why is that? What's happening? Virtual memory is basically a trick that computer uses when it runs out of physical RAM. It uses a chunk of your slower storage, like your hard drive, 
or maybe an SSD, which is faster but still way slower than RAM and pretends it's extra RAM. The huge problem is accessing data from that storage is thousands, maybe millions of times slower than getting it from actual RAM. So when the system needs data that's been pushed out to virtual memory, it has to swap things back and forth. Data goes from slow storage to fast RAM. Other data goes from RAM to storage. And all that swapping, sometimes called thrashing, just causes massive delays. Yeah. It really hits performance hard. Ah, okay. So if your computer feels sluggish, you know when you have tons of tabs open and apps running, it's probably relying heavily on virtual memory. Understanding RAM, cache, and virtual memory helps you see why it's slowing down, not just that it is. You can pinpoint the bottleneck. All right, next up. Another fix suggested for those slow marathon computers, install a GPU, a graphics processor unit. What makes a GPU so powerful? It isn't just one single thing, is it? No, absolutely not. A GPU's power comes from a combination of factors working together. It's not just one number. People might think about clock speed, maybe. But the real difference maker, especially these days, is often the number of cores and the memory bandwidth. See, a CPU might have, I don't know, 4, 8, maybe 16 really powerful cores. A GPU, it has hundreds, often thousands, of smaller, very specialized cores. Think of it like uh, building a house. A CPU is maybe one super skilled master builder doing everything precisely. A GPU is like an army of workers, each specialized in one fast task, like nailing boards or laying bricks all working at the same time. For things like graphics, video editing, AI, you need that massive parallel processing, that army. Wow, okay. An army of workers. Exactly. And then beyond the cores, you've got the amount of VRAM that's the GPU's own dedicated video memory. And crucially, it's type and bandwidth. That dictates how fast data moves between the memory and those thousands of cores. You need super fast, high volume memory to keep all those cores fed with data. So they're not just sitting around waiting. And yet, clock speed still matters, as is the architecture or generation of the chip itself, how efficient each core is. But it's the combination that counts. Right. That mix is key. And that's probably where people get tripped up comparing cards. So if you're looking at a computer for serious gaming or complex video work or simulations, you really need to look at all those GPU specs together. They tell you how well it'll handle those really demanding tasks. Okay, so we've hit memory and GPUs for speed. But the technicians also mentioned something else using a modular design and keeping the BIOS up to date. Let's take modular design first. What's the practical upside of a computer being modular? Oh, modular design has huge advantages, yeah. especially in a situation like a live event where you need to fix things fast. The big ones are, first, it makes computers easy to repair. If one bit breaks, say, the power supply, you just swap out that single part. You don't need to replace the whole machine. Okay. Second, building on that, it's easy to upgrade. Your graphics card is getting old. Pop it out. Put a new one in. Need more storage. Mm -hmm. Add another drive. It extends the computer's life. Plus, it lets you customize the system exactly how you need it. Build it for a specific job. And maybe most importantly for big operations, it's often way cheaper to replace just one part instead of the whole computer. Yeah. That saves a lot of money over time. Right. So, yeah, if you're building systems for something really demanding like this marathon broadcast, modularity gives you amazing flexibility and it saves money. It's all about keeping things running and controlling costs. It's kind of like building with Legos then. If one brick is wrong or old, just swap it out. You don't buy a whole new castle. Exactly. Perfect analogy. No need to trash the whole thing for one broken piece. Love it. Okay, now the BIOS. Basic input output system. People kind of know it's important for starting up, but what does it actually do? Give us, say, two Q functions. Right, the BIOS. It does a couple of absolutely vital things totally behind the scenes every single time you turn your computer on. First, think of it as the fundamental translator between the operating system, like Windows or Mac OS, and your physical hardware. The keyboard, the screen, the drives, it lets them talk at the most basic level. It's the very first piece of software that runs. Okay, the translator. Second, it performs a crucial health check called the power on self test or post. It literally goes through and checks. Is the RAM there? Is the graphics card working? Can I see the keyboard? It does this before it even tries to load the operating system. If the POST fails, the computer usually just stops and beeps at you. Ah, uh, so that's what those beeps mean sometimes. Okay, yeah. so it's doing these essential checks and translations just to get things going. Without the BIOS, the computer is just inert. Which brings up another point. Why does the BIOS have to be on non-volatile memory? Why not just load it into RAM like other programs? Ah, good question. It's stored on non-volatile memory typically a special chip like ROM or flash memory, specifically, because non-volatile means it keeps its data even when the power is off. This is absolutely critical, 
the BIOS holds the very first instructions the computer needs to even start up. If those instructions were in RAM, they'd disappear the moment you turned the computer off. Next time you powered it on, it would have no idea what to do. Complete amnesia. It also means any settings you change in the BIOS setup, like which drive to boot from, or the system time are saved and remembered for the next time. Got it. So it's the computer's permanent memory for how to wake itself up, even if it's been unplugged for weeks. Like, a uh, machine muscle memory. Okay, let's switch gears a bit. Connectivity. All those devices at the marathon, timing gates, cameras, computers, they're all networked. What's the actual hardware bit inside a desktop PC that lets it connect to a network? That piece of hardware is the network interface controller. Uh, most people call it an NIC, or sometimes a network card. It's basically the hardware doorway that lets your computer talk to the network. It translates the data from inside your computer into signals that can go over a cable or through the air wirelessly, and vice versa. It's the physical connection point. The NIC. Got it. And thinking about the Marathon's network needing to reach the outside world, besides the hardware, like the NIC and the software running on the computers, what's the third essential piece needed for that local network to connect to the internet? That crucial third piece is the internet service provider, the ISP. The ISP is the company that actually provides the connection from your local network, whether it's at the Marathon or in your house, to the massive global network that is the internet. They manage the infrastructure, the big pipes that link you up. They're the bridge to the wider web. Right, the ISP. So NIC for the local connection, ISP for the global one. Makes sense. That applies whether you're running a marathon broadcast or just checking your email at home. Now let's touch on some more advanced tech the organizers mentioned. Cloud computing. We hear that term all the time. What exactly is cloud computing, really? At its heart, cloud computing is about using shared computing resources things like processing power, storage space, databases, software that are delivered as services over the internet. So instead of buying and managing all your own servers and software, you essentially rent access to those resources from a cloud provider like Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, usually on a pay-as-you-go basis. Think of it like electricity. You just plug in and use what you need. Renting computing power. No. Okay. And how does using the cloud actually reduce the hardware needed at the marathon event itself? What's the real benefit there? There are a few big advantages for the hardware on site. First is cost saving on the local machines, because most of the heavy lifting, the serious processing, the big data storage, maybe complex analytics is happening in the cloud providers' data centers. The computers at the event don't need to be nearly as powerful. They can have less RAM, slower processors, smaller hard drives. That saves money up front. Okay, less powerful local machines. Second, it drastically reduces the need for local IT infrastructure. You don't need rooms full of servers at the marathon venue or big teams to manage them all. The cloud provider handles the back-end infrastructure. And third, related to that, you usually don't need dedicated local backup systems or complex disaster recovery setups. Cloud services typically include robust backup and recovery options as part of the package. Wow, that sounds like a massive advantage for something temporary and complex like a big event. More flexible, probably scalable too. But are there times when you'd still want local hardware? Maybe for things that absolutely cannot fail or have delays? That's a really important point, yes. Cloud is great, but local hardware might still be better for tasks needing extremely low latency, like near instant response times, where even a tiny network delay is too much. Ooh. Or maybe for highly sensitive data that an organization wants to keep totally physically contained for security reasons. For a live event, you might have some core real-time systems, maybe the absolute final timing signal running locally, just to eliminate any dependency on internet connectivity at that critical moment. It's about balancing risk. That makes sense. But for a lot of things we do daily, mm -hmm. think about Google Docs or Netflix or online games. They're all using the cloud, so our devices don't have to do all the work. The heavy lifting happens elsewhere. Okay, last topic, and this one sounds really futuristic. Virtual reality, VR. The marathon organizers are looking into it. For a lot of us, VR still seems like sci-fi or just for games. What is VR, basically, and how could it possibly apply to something like a marathon? So virtual reality, fundamentally, is an artificial environment created with software. It's designed to make you feel like you're physically present in a different place, whether it's a real place simulated or a completely imagined world. You usually experience it through a headset that covers your eyes and ears, immersing you visually and audibly. Often, you can interact with this virtual world, too. Okay, an artificial environment you feel present in. Now, the practical side. Give us a couple of real ways athletes could actually benefit from VR for a marathon. It's moving beyond just gaming, right? Oh, absolutely. VR has huge potential for athletes. 
one really practical use. Athletes could use interactive training modules designed for marathon prep. Imagine being able to run a virtual replica of the actual marathon course, same hills, same turns, maybe even simulated crowd noise, all from their own home gym, anywhere in the world. It lets them get familiar with the course, plan their race without traveling. That's cool. Train on the real course virtually. What else? Another big one is accessibility. Athletes from anywhere could participate in something like a global marathon series without the cost and time of international travel. They could run the race virtually, maybe competing against others in real time or against virtual pacers. It could open up major events to way more people. It breaks down geographical barriers. So it's not just playing games, it's serious training. It's making competitions more accessible globally. VR is really starting to branch out into practical, impactful uses. That's pretty exciting. Wow, what a journey today. We started thinking about that huge marathon and ended up deep inside the computer. We looked at RAM as the CPU's workbench, saw how cache speeds things up, and why virtual memory can sometimes be a drag. Then we got into the power of GPUs, that army of cores, and how modular design makes computers like Legos easy to fix and upgrade. Plus, the unsung hero, the BIOS, doing its checks and balances, needing that non-volatile memory to remember how to start. Then we connected everything with NICs and ISPs, jumped into the cloud and saw how it shifts computing into a service, reducing hardware needs, and finally explored VR, seeing it move beyond games into real training and participation tools. Understanding these basics, these concepts, it isn't just academic, it really gives you a shortcut to being properly well-informed about the tech that's, well, everywhere around you. It lets you see the invisible stuff making it all work. And maybe a final thought to chew on. These concepts we talked about, they aren't separate static things. They're constantly evolving, merging. So think about what happens next. What new things become possible when you combine, say, the hyper-efficiency of modular design with the almost limitless power of cloud computing, and then layer on the immersive experience of VR? How does that change what a computer even is in the next five or ten years? That's a great question to leave everyone with. As you go about your week, look at the tech you use, see if you can spot these ideas in action RAM when your phone lags, cloud when you stream a movie. The more you notice, the more you'll see how this deep dive connects to your everyday digital life. In order for us to make more podcasts like this, please help the channel out by clicking on that subscribe button and sharing us with your friends so that we can get more subscribers. Also follow us on TikTok at Miss Long Education. And remember, don't do it the long way, do it the Mr. Long way.